My name is Dwayne Osterland, and this is Addiction in the Mind. And today we have a special guest. Her name is Cindy Shadell, and she specializes in working with partners uh, who are struggling with an infidelity, or also with partners who are struggling with um, uh, sex addiction, uh, or their partner is struggling with sex addiction. So I'm going to let her talk a little bit about herself. And uh, start from there. Hey, Cindy. Hi. Thanks, Dwayne. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you do? And sure. So um, I have a private practice in mm. uh, Culver City and also in El Segundo, mm. and I specialize. It, I started out specializing in working with partners of sex addicts, and I ran a group, and I gradually realized that that um, I really love the population, and through mm. working with partners, I realized that there were a lot of individuals and couples who were struggling with betrayal and infidelity, but that didn't necessarily qualify as sex addicts. So I okay. sort of broadened my practice into that as well. And not only do I work with the partners at this time, I also work with individuals and, um, and couples involving right. that. And I run a support group. It's sort of psychoeducation um, slash process group for partners of sex addicts. And I would imagine uh, that this is a pretty tough population. I mean, dealing with uh, infidelity and betrayal um, is definitely um, a difficult and painful um, experience for partners. So I would imagine that this is a pretty tough, tough field. Yes, it is. And I think there is, there's such a need for it, first of all. And I think um, when you're dealing with this kind of an issue, it affects mm -hmm. so many people. It's really mm -hmm. pervasive. And a lot of times people don't want to get help because there's a lot of shame involved with it. Whether you're talking about sex addiction or partners or just straight betrayal and infidelity, it's really a shameful subject. So, right. um, so I know that there are a lot of people out there that need help when it comes to this. It's just that a lot of times they have trouble sort of reaching out for support because of the nature of it. Right. And yeah, I would, I would imagine that would be, it would be tough. And especially, uh, there's probably a lot of crisis. I would imagine they come in in a lot of crisis. Yes. What I see from people is that they come in really in a state of complete and total crisis. And what I often hear from people is, you, you know, you're seeing me as I not, as I am not really. <laughs> in other okay. words, like okay. this is not who I am in my normal life because you're seeing them at the moment where they've had the, the rug pulled out from under them. And so there's a lot of containment and crisis management that happens in the beginning. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to break this into three parts. Uh, the first part is when people initially come in uh, for treatment around this issue, if they have a, um, a partner that uh, they've found out about a betrayal, or um, uh, if they have a partner that is struggling with sex addiction, we're going to talk about a little bit about what the differences are in that and and how we uh, decipher that. And then um, in the next part, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the treatment, how people get help, how they progress through treatment. And then in the third part, we're going to talk about more of the long-term outcomes and helping people through um, that longer term uh, recovery from that betrayal. So with the first part, let's let's talk a little bit about when people come in and what's initially happening and you know when you get the phone call at your practice and something's happening and yeah. you get that message. Yeah, usually I would say um, eight, nine times out of ten, mm -hmm. um, it's the partner who calls because they've just okay. discovered a behavior. So right. usually people show up in my office because um, someone's gotten caught. Right. Um, okay. it, rarely do people volunteer to come in before that time. Okay. Um, so oftentimes a partner has just discovered some sort of acting out behavior. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I have to assess initially is are we looking at sex addiction or are we just kind of looking at straight infidelity or betrayal? Okay. So how do you go about doing that? I know that we do um, some, some assessments, but how do you start to take the clients through that process? Yeah. So what I want to get is an idea about the sexual acting out behavior. So when I'm looking at addiction, I'm starting to see 
um, a progression of, mm -hmm. of the behavior. I'm starting to see that it affects other areas of this person's life and that the person continues to do it despite consequences. Right. Um, and that perhaps the person has tried to stop at some point and is unable okay. to do that. So I'm so, asking questions around okay. things like that. Okay. Because one of the things that, um, you know, uh, sex addiction has been in the media, has been around, and um, I've had a lot of people come into my practice where they're, um, they're labeling themselves as a, as a sex addict, they've had an infidelity, and when we do a, a little bit of a deeper assessment, we're like, well, maybe, maybe, that, maybe you're not a sex addict, yeah. um, you know, maybe this is just infidelity, and um, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, when you're dealing with that, have you seen that? Yes, or? yeah, and I think sometimes it's a, seen that, yes. Or? Yeah, that I do that can help is that I will ask the person if they can go and take a sort of self-assessment measuring test okay. like the sex addiction screening test or the HIBI or some sort of um, self-measurement so that they can get an idea about whether this is problematic or not. Right. But I think more often than not, if it's just straight betrayal or infidelity, um, the, the betrayal or the affair or whatever it might be is really symptomatic of something that is happening in the relationship. Not to say that sex addiction can't sort of include that, but right. I think the main difference is that when I'm looking at sex addiction, it, it goes back to early childhood. I can really sort okay. of pinpoint the roots and see that this person was acting out or coping in a sexual way, even if it wasn't sexual intercourse, from a very early time. Okay, so you can really see, when you're looking at someone who's struggling with sex addiction, you can really see that timeline. You can see that they've had this behavior before this initial affair that yes. has been discovered. Uh, you can see that this was a coping pattern for them for a long time. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's sort of the main mm -hmm. um, marker. And I think a lot of times when I'm working with partners of sex addicts, they will say, you know, um, even if they feel they were unaware of the behavior. There were so, sort of markers along the road. There were red flags or they, they sort of go back in time, you know, 5, 10, 20 years into the relationship and say, something at this point didn't feel right. And oftentimes when I'm just dealing with straight infide infidelity mm -hmm. or betrayal, um, I'm not hearing that as much. I'm oh, hearing okay. this came out of nowhere. I'm so surprised. And so there's not that history that they, they have that they show it's, in general. It's, it's yeah. more when it's just a straight betrayal, it's, it's a little more out of the blue. The behavior doesn't fit into the overall life pattern, and you can see that it's more isolated. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. that's that has been my experience. I I had um, a partner ask me once, and this was a partner of a sex addict. You know, um, did did my partner being bored with our marriage did that trigger his sex addiction? Right. And so I think that was a sort of a really good way for us to open up the conversation about the. Um, the longevity and the pervasiveness of sex addiction versus one or two isolated experiences. Right. So when you're coming in, when uh, the couple's coming in, this is part of the assessment process that you're going to do to really make sure that if it's sex addiction, that they get help for that. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, then, um, you know, they get help for that relationship. Um, I think one of the things to note, though, is uh, for both of them, the betrayal is a huge huge part of that, regardless whether it's sex addiction or just infidelity. I mean, the betrayal is huge at the same time. Yes, I agree. It's sort of like the, um, that's the wound that is bleeding when they come in. And I mm -hmm. think regardless whether you're dealing with, you know, addiction or betrayal and infidelity, that, um, that the first thing is to sort of get that bleeding under control. Okay. And, um, so, so when they come in, uh, first you do that, you, you know, do this assessment and make sure that, okay, this isn't sex addiction, um, this is just infidelity. Um, what are the immediate kind of steps that you do as they come into your office and um, how do you start to help them right away in that, in that immediate? Yeah, so what I want to know initially is, um, is, is the affair or is the uh, addictive behavior still continuing? Mm -hmm. um, because if that's the case, we'll need to get that under control before we can do any sort of couples work. Okay. Um, so that's the first part of it. And the other part of it that I asked the partner and that I want to know is, um, you know, partners tend to become really great detectives when, you know, whether it's sex addiction or not, um, mm -hmm. when a person feels they're being lied to, they tend to, um, look in every corner and, um, start doing detective like work. So what I want to know is, 
Are you doing that detective work? Do you feel like you know um, everything there is to know? Are you still looking mm -hmm. for more information? I want to know how much about the acting out um, has has been sort of laid out on the table. Right. Okay. So you, you kind of start to get a, an immediate picture. Um, how do you uh, handle the partner? Because you said there was initially like there's um, kind of the relationship is bleeding. The, the, there's this huge... Uh, wound what do you do around that in in the first couple sessions yeah so one of the things that i think is really important is to allow the the hurt partner mm -hmm. so to speak um to tell their story and to have okay. the other partner um be able to take that in and not use it as a way to shame or mm -hmm. Um, manipulate, but as a way for the person who has acted out to start to take ownership and for the person who has been hurt to feel heard. Because uh, the initial sort of storytelling part of it is a really, really important part of kind of laying the groundwork for trust and stability to even start again. Um, right. So that's a big part of the containment. And on top of that, I think um, sort of goes hand in hand with um, getting other support. So I think for partners and for the person who is acting out, if if he or she is a sex addict, to get some group support from people who are experiencing something similar. That, that I see as being one of the um, most helpful factors in the beginning. Yeah, I, I, you know, in working with uh, sex addiction, and we see a lot of partners come into our practice, mm -hmm. um, they feel very, very alone in that uh, pain. And um, when they get to meet with other people who have experienced something similar, mm -hmm. they don't feel quite so alone and, and there's some relief in that. I mean, it doesn't take away the pain and the hurt, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it still gives them some stability, I yeah. think. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 um, you know, I have heard many times from mm -hmm. uh, partners that I have been working with that they've been really resistant to getting group help. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because they have a lot of shame and they, they want to mm -hmm. stay in isolation. And so there's usually a lot of push-pull around that. And I see that the moment they get into a group is when some, some real motion starts to take oh, okay. place. Okay. So encouraging it, them to take that step and yeah. reach out and build that support system. And, and um, do the partners, when it's, when it's not sex addiction and it's just uh, kind of straight infidelity, do... How do the partners handle um, uh, that? You know that feeling of betrayal, that um, uh, that initial moment where they kind of realize, you know, their life is now in crisis. Everything what they thought was there is not there, and um, I'm just curious how they handle that when it's not necessarily sex addiction. So they may not have any history mm -hmm. uh, of the behavior, but you know. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think you're just trying to understand the distinction yeah. for partners when it's yeah. just sort of yeah. straight infidelity or betrayal. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, the wounds are still there, mm -hmm. um, but perhaps there aren't as many triggers because they don't go as far back. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not to say it's not as traumatic in the moment. I mean, I think for, for both partners, whether it's addiction or not, there is a, there is some um, grieving the old relationship as it was. Okay. Um, perhaps the the river of grief is is deeper on the sex addiction side. I, I, I think right. both people when they're in it could argue that they That's, feel the same. Right. Okay. Um, does that make sense? No, I think that makes that makes a lot of sense, and I think that that you know has also been my experience in in working uh, with these populations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So. Okay, well, um, we're going to move in. In the next part, we're going to look at what uh, initially is the treatment protocol, how uh, we help people through this process, um, and some of the longer-term uh, recovery or healing that needs to take place and how relationships survive. Um, you know, what relationships survive, uh, what relationships uh, don't, and how do they uh, move from the betrayal to um, a healing relationship and a thriving relationship. So we're going to do that in the next part. So we'll talk to you then.
Hi, my name is Leanne Marquez. I'm a marriage and family therapist intern, and I work with biofeedback and neurofeedback as an integrative approach in therapy. And what that is, is that it's a body scan, and it scans your body or your brain waves that gives me additional information about you. And these things could be unconscious, and that helps me with your therapy and helps you move along quicker. Also, I'm offering a free session, 20 minutes, for you if you contact me. And I work with children, I work with adolescents and adults. So contact me at journeytobecomingwhole.com or my number is 949-478-2324. Thank you. Dwayne Osterlin, this is Addiction of the Mind, and we're going to move in part. Uh, we're going to move to part two, um, uh, looking at the difference between sex addiction and uh, infidelity in relationships. And in this part, we're going to start looking at the longer-term uh, care of clients who come in um, with this issue, and how we help them move through that process. Um, and we'll go from there. So. Let's kind of talk about, you know, the clients have come in, mm -hmm. the initial kind of shock uh, of, uh, of the first few sessions has is, is kind of gone down a little bit. Uh, both partners, the, the affair or infidelity um, is out in the open and um, it's, now they're talking about it. What are the next steps yeah. uh, that uh, clients take or that you take with clients? Sure. So I think this is when, when I start to see more of the split in terms of the treatment modality. So if, okay. if we're talking about um, sex addiction, then mm -hmm. um, I prefer to, to work um, to either refer out or work with the partner individually and have the addict um, also working through individual treatment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can include going through an intensive program or inpatient care depending on their needs. Okay. Because if a sex addict is still acting out and the behaviors are not under control, um, couples work is just fruitless at that point. Okay. Um, and a lot of times, we're going to ask a question. Well, I was going to say, so if, they, if, they're, if they're still struggling with, with sex addiction, and I found the same thing, and they're not getting treatment for that, it's, there's no way the relationship is going to is going to be able to thrive in any way or is going to survive. Yeah. Um, it's going to stay in its dysfunction mm -hmm. if, if the addiction itself is not really arrested yeah. at that point. Absolutely. I mean, it's really just a band-aid and sometimes not even that. So Right. And, I've you know, working in this field, I've seen a lot of um, couples go into therapy and one person is, is a sex addict and the sex addiction never really gets addressed mm -hmm. and they try and do couples therapy and it can be um, kind of a disaster, actually, yeah. because it almost the wounds just kind of get keep churned over and over yeah. again, yeah. and the addict continues to act out. Exactly. And um, and it's yeah, and so it's not good for anybody in that situation. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you know, I'm sure you see this a lot too. It's like when um, when a person is still acting out in their addiction, they're often still trying to cover up their behavior. And so there is this mm -hmm. process of this, right. um, you know, uh, this uh, sort of uh, disclosure that happens in steps or in stages, mm -hmm. which is really damaging for the partner. So I think right. that's part of the reason for, for separating the two in the initial stages. Right. Um, and if they are sort of working towards a disclosure, a formal disclosure, that that can be done with, both of their therapists right. and they can come together at a time when something like that is going to be w worth the effort. Right, right, definitely. And, and they, they have to be able to do that or otherwise it just, it just doesn't, doesn't work. That's been my experience. So if it's just, if we've ruled out that it's a sex addiction and it's just, um, infidelity, yeah. then what happens? So, you know, the, the, the first session it's, it's kind of out in the open now, the first couple sessions have happened, you've built some rapport with the clients, mm -hmm. where do you go from there? Like, what's the... So, um, as I was saying before, I think it's really important to to know, and you know, we can only know what we can know, but right. to know if the affair or the acting out, even if it's an isolated incident, 
um, has stopped because mm-hmm. if it hasn't, once again, it's sort of it's fruitless to do right. couples therapy. At that you can't point. really build trust at that point if the betrayal continues. Exactly. Right. So if we've de- if we've determined that there is you know there's no more affair, there's no more acting out happening, um, then we can really start to work to repair. And the way that I start to do that is really by allowing. Um, to do that is really by betrayed to tell their story and allow them to ask questions. A lot of times I think it's much better to ask those questions in a therapeutic environment rather than having it be something that happens, you know, at 2 a.m. one morning at home in a rage. It can, right. it can be more productive if, if um, the partner, the hurt partner sort of comes to the table with, okay, here's my list of questions. Here's what I want to know. And part of the reason that I think it's really important to do it in therapy is because some of the things that partners want to know are gory details and are right. only going to be hurtful to them in the long run. Right. So I think a therapist can help you weigh, you know, why do you want to ask that question and is it going to be helpful for you and perhaps this relationship if you decide mm-hmm. to stay together right. in the long run? And that's, uh, yeah, we've we found that a lot with partners. I mean, they want to make sense of it all. Mm-hmm. So they almost are looking for every single detail. They want to understand, was it me? Did I do something wrong? Was I not beautiful enough, sexy Mm -hmm. enough? Was I not sexual enough? Mm -hmm. Was I not a good enough partner? And so they start asking all these detailed questions. And then, you know, the the other partner or the person who had the affair, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they may give too much detail or... They're tr- they don't know how to answer that, and um, yeah, it kind of comes out in that staggered way, and it's kind of like a re-wounding, a re-wounding, and a re-wounding, and, yeah. and that, yeah, that's definitely, you've definitely seen that, and that can be really tough. Yeah, yeah, so I think there's a lot of overlap there, and I think, um, you know, I was sort of talking about that detective work. I think just mm-hmm. as, you know, you're expecting the partner who has had the affair um, to stop the behavior you're you're also going to have a conversation and expect the person who's doing the detective work to stop doing that behavior because all of that undermines the um, ability of the relationship to rebuild. You know, I know when, when we work with partners in, in the sex addiction field, we at some point do uh, a formal disclosure process where it's it's with, um, with a therapist where the addict um, basically gives all the information uh, with those limits, like we talked about, there's mm-hmm. gory details that just don't help anybody. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, they give the information in a in a formalized way to the partner, so the partner can decide: Do I want to stay in this relationship? Do I want to leave this relationship? Mm-hmm. And it kind of creates a a um, state where they can then build onto, you know, build onto the relationship, but like a starting point. Mm-hmm. Now, with people who just have an affair, do you do something similar or or uh, how does that work? Yes, I do something similar, but it's not quite as formal. So a lot of times it will be through discussion. Um, it will be, and I can do it in couples therapy. Whereas I think when, when, you know, I work with an addict and a partner, I prefer to do that separately and come together okay. um, so that each person can kind of have their representative there right. um, with a person who is, you know, with a couple where we're just talking about a, a, a one time or a two time affair. I want to say just, but right. you get the idea. Yeah. Um, it's something that I can facilitate as a couple, and I also think that that builds intimacy because it um, is a process where they have to really be vulnerable and open and honest with each other. Okay. Um, so it differs in that way slightly. And half of my question is, how do you work with the the, the person who's done the betrayal in, in uh, being able to start to... You know, because in a way, if, if they want the relationship, they don't want to hurt the partner anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, they may really regret their actions or they may go, that was really, you know, I was in a bad place in my life and I really regret those actions. How do you work with them in helping them tell their side of it? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I think that's a really important part of the dynamic. And I, I think that or important part of the process. And one of the things that... Um, you know, every couple is different, but oftentimes the dynamic I see is that the acting out partner or the person who has, has had an affair um, is doing so because in the relationship they feel one down in some way mm-hmm. or they feel um, they feel um, like a child in some way. So mm-hmm. that's often the dynamic that I see. And so I think it becomes about talking about the feelings that led to the affair Um, Mm -hmm. which are really important. And it's also important for the person, I think, who has had the affair 
to um, to be able to really take in how it's hurt their partner right. without turning it into shame, without without sort of going into themselves and saying I'm such a bad person, but to really sit with how they've hurt their partner. Okay. Um, because it's my experience that once partners feel like they've been heard and that their their um, partner really understands how they've hurt them, um, that's a really big moment where I start to see a shift. And how <clears throat> long? I mean, I know I know every relationship is different, mm-hmm. but if you could put, how long does that process take? Well, I would say it's different for everyone, but I but if the behaviors have stopped, I would say anywhere within that first 90-day window, I start to see a shift. Because a lot of times what um, the hurt partner isn't recognizing is that um, the partner who has been acting out or perhaps having an affair um, has feelings of euphoria, has um, feelings associated with the other person, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so their feelings toward their um, their spouse or their, their partner can get really muddled because of that. Uh, so a lot of times it's like once they stop seeing that person or once they stop having the affair, then they can get some clarity about how they're feeling about their relationship. Okay. Um, so they have to be able to... So, the, the their acting out partner or the person who's had the affair needs some time away from that um, that uh, that space that uh, what was going on yeah. so that they can kind of look at like the bigger picture yes. what do they really want yeah. um, uh, is this really where they want to want to go mm-hmm. and um, is this is this really the direction they want and mm-hmm. being able to getting some emotional distance to be yeah. able to process that it sounds like that, that that's what they need. Uh, to be able to do that. Um, one thing I wanted to add is I know when working with sex addicts, it takes a while to get to disclosure because um, if they're really struggling with sex addiction, a lot of time they go into an intensive program, a lot of time they go into an intensive thing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes getting to disclosure can be a little bit farther down the road for someone struggling with sex addiction. And I'm imagining with just the, the affair that it, it can probably be a little bit quicker or a little bit faster if that it can I still think that I wouldn't do it within the first couple of weeks because I think if a person is um if a couple is coming into therapy and someone's been caught there is generally resistance to that so Mm -hmm. um there's usually some pushback in some way so I would avoid doing it um initially within the first you know couple of weeks perhaps in the first month but that's still sooner than perhaps what would happen with a, a couple who's dealing with sex addiction okay Um, yeah, I mean, I, my, um, feeling or my experience has been that with the person who is having the affair, um, that there, once there is a, once that sort of relationship is cut off, they have to start going through the grief around that before the grief around what has happened in their relationship can hit them. And so there's usually a window of time where, you know, um, where they've been caught before that can happen. Mm, okay. Um, there seems to be a lot of anger and a lot of, um, and a lot of resistance to it before, before they kind of hit bottom enough to see it. Right. To be able to, to see the grief, what yeah. they've lost. Yeah. What, okay. Okay. That makes sense. So like, um, what about when, um, uh, you know, they, they've started to, uh, be able to, um, you know, that, that process of, of disclosure, it's all kind of out there. Uh, everything's been discussed and they start to move into some repair work around the relationship. I, I'm wondering, how do they start to do that? Like, what's the process when they start doing this kind of repair? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, in both cases, whether you're talking about sex addiction or infidelity and betrayal, that um, what we really start to do is just peel away the layers of what is happening dynamically between the two people and talk about um, you know, what kind of led up to this? What were the underlying feelings? What were the elephants in the room that nobody was talking about? Okay. Um, what were, um, what were the little lies that were happening that, you know, seemingly have nothing to do with the infidelity? A lot of times I find that there's, um, a lot of covering up around issues like finances or, um, parenting children. Um, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of, um, a lot of times they're not talking about some of these more uh, minute issues in a, an emotionally honest way. Right. They're, they're not able to express their feelings, they're not, or they feel they can't, or yeah. they don't know how, or some combination of that. So now a lot of times this is a bigger dynamic than just the affair itself. It's, it's that there's this relationship mm-hmm. 
uh, issue where, uh, yeah, they're not able to communicate honestly. They're not able to um, talk about these these little important, you know, raising kids and all the life stressors and money, and but they're not able to talk about that. So yeah. they start to feel shut down or... Well, they start to act it out. Uh, what I have found in cases of sort of straight infidelity is that um, it's acted out in other ways before an affair will happen. Okay. So it's acted out perhaps in more passive aggressive ways before an affair will take place. But I think that, you know, absolutely what you're talking about is, is kind of the crux of it because I think what, um, you know, what we all do, but what people do mm -hmm. is we bring our family of origins into our relationships. And so mm -hmm. I think one of the things that has has been really helpful for the couples that I've worked with is to talk about what in this relationship feels familiar to you. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that f familiarity might be um, things that are unhealthy or that are not good, but that we sort of do out of habit or do because we know or do because we learn from our family mm -hmm. of origin. So, so they definitely have to do some, some work in that area mm -hmm. uh, of their own stuff, what they bring into the relationship to be able to understand. Uh, a big question that I get a lot from clients is, uh, when is she or he going to trust me again? And mm -hmm. when am I going to be able to trust this person again? Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could talk about that, the, the reestablishment of trust. And yeah. Yeah. I think, that, you know, in terms of long-term uh, sort of recovery, that is the, the biggest piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, because I think what the person who has done the acting out, whether it's an addict or a person who has mm -hmm. had one affair, I think what that person can, can forget is how many external triggers there are for the person that has been hurt. Uh, and so a lot of times I will hear, you know, the phone ringing was a trigger for me because that's where I first discovered my husband acting out or the, the computer is a trigger for me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of external things can be triggers for the partners. And it's up to the partner to work on those things and to mm -hmm. um, to work on healing that part of him or herself. But it also is really important, I think, for the person who has um, acted out to understand, like, okay, these triggers might happen and um, I don't have to get defensive about it. I, we can sort of take it in stride and we can talk about it and... Um, and I can respond in a way that has me understanding, but also has me not shaming myself for acting out in the so relationship. So really being able to, it sounds like uh, being able to tolerate the betrayed partner's um, emotions when, when they're, they're kind of brought back to that place of discovery again, and they feel all those emotions. And for the betraying party to really just be there with them, and yeah, not shaming themselves, but being understanding. And that's a big part of the, the trust process. Yeah. Yeah. I think that word is perfect. Sort of just being in and, and sitting with all of the difficulty of those emotions. And for the right. person who is, you know, being triggered or who has been betrayed, um, for them to be able to start to have some awareness um, and be able to voice that to their partner. In other words, Right. I am feeling really triggered by ne right now. I don't know if it's something that you've done or, or I don't know if it's this sort of old trauma of what we've been through, but I just want to be able to talk about it. Right. Um, so for that person to be able to talk about their experience rather than to lash out or blame or accuse initially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And one, one of the things I tell to a lot of, um, uh, of the, of the, the addict or the people who have done the betrayal is that this just takes time. You have to just be patient uh, with your partner to make sure they have that time to heal and um, to kind of just be able to be there and that, you know, really make an effort to um, display trustworthy, noticeable uh, actions, you know, um, so that you can slowly build that and your partner can notice that yeah. over time. Yes. I think that's that. I yeah. so agree with that. I think there's this point at which, um, the crisis has passed and a new normal is starting to be established and it's like recovery fatigue, right. <laughs> you know, right. so right. it gets right. exhausting and, it, and it's a marathon. And so mm -hmm. I think if people can remember that, um, you know, following through with every little action is, uh, might seem small, but it, that's a really big step towards. Yeah. And I like the trust. idea you say it's a marathon. Yeah. It, it, this really does take time to yeah. heal. And, and, it, and with sex addiction, I think it might be even longer because they have to get the addiction mm -hmm. under control. Um, but with any betrayal, it just, it takes some, it takes yes. some time. Yeah. So, 
Um, okay, well, um, we're going to go to part three, where we're going to look at how relationships that have infidelity or addiction actually become thriving relationships in the long run or can become thriving relationships and what they do in the long term. So stay tuned for that. This is Addiction in the Mind, and we'll see you in a minute. Welcome to Elements Therapeutic Massage at the Gateway Center. We offer a therapeutic massage, which is where we combine the different massage modalities. This is to create a customized experience designed to address your specific needs. Everyone here at Elements believes in the health benefits of a regular massage regimen. That's why we offer a flexible, affordable, non-binding wellness program that you can even share with someone you care about. We're open seven days a week, so give us a call and book an appointment or visit us at our website. Thank you, and expect more from your massage. Hello, my name is Dwayne Osterlin. This is Addiction to the Mind, and we're continuing our series on uh, infidelity and betrayal and relationships, the difference between that and also sex addiction and how relationships heal. And in the first two parts, we talked about the initial discovery of betrayal. In the second part, we talked about the first initial steps that um, clients can take in, in healing the relationship. And in this part, we're going to talk about the long-term uh, uh, work that uh, a relationship has gone through, what they need to do uh, in the long term. So um, let's talk about that. So the relationship, it's... You know, the discovery, they've discovered the affair or the sex addiction, they've, um, they've done initial therapy, maybe the disclosure is done, and now they're moving into the later part of repairing the relationship. And can you tell us a little bit about that part and what's kind of happening for the relationship at this point? And, yeah, um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So I think, um, you know, the couples that I see that uh, do the best have mm -hmm. both made a commitment to doing their own work. Um, okay. And oftentimes that can mean being in individual therapy or in couple therapy, but it really means sort of doing some soul searching and looking at, you know, what are the things from my family of origin that have contributed to this, um, uh, not as a way to place blame, but as a way to understand it in context. Okay. And um, to start looking at, you know, what is um, not only what is my role, but what is what happens around um, myself and attachment and how mm -hmm. comfortable am I with intimacy? Um, mm -hmm. And it starts to move into kind of, um, you know, the joy and the fear that can arise in creating a new level of intimacy with your partner. Oh, okay. So they, they really have to, it sounds like... Um, and this has also been my experience, if they move into this longer term kind of thriving relationship, each, each, the, the person who either has a sex addiction or has done the betrayal or the partner, they really have to move into their own work. They really have to understand how they attach, um, how they feel close to others. Uh, it sounds like a, a lot of, um, emotional exploration, a lot of really understanding themselves and what they bring to the relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the idea of being individuated in a relationship, in other words, it's like that. Um, I, I show clients the Venn diagram, right? Like those overlapping mm -hmm. circles. So it's, right. you know, you want to have a piece of yourself and you want to have, um, you want to have autonomy and at the same time, interdependence is okay and healthy mm -hmm. in a relationship. So I think that a lot of times for couples who, um, both have external support on their sides, whether it's therapeutic support or group support or friends or um, mm -hmm. some sort of support outside of each other that they can mm -hmm. both call on uh, as a resource is really helpful because I think it puts less pressure on the relationship and for that mm -hmm. partner to be um, the one to answer all of, of mm -hmm. the other person's needs. So I think that's a big... So if they're working on this relationship, and just make sure I understand, mm -hmm. if they're working on this relationship, they're each going to have their their individual support as well as have some togetherness. So they begin to learn uh, how to be themselves and together at the same time. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's something that you know we can all struggle with to a certain extent. So it's 
Right. It's helpful for, you know, even couples who aren't dealing with, with these types of issues. But, um, I think that's a big piece of it. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of the coming together and the being intimate part of it, I think a lot of times what I hear from couples is, well, I thought we were intimate, but we really weren't. We really mm. weren't having those honest, authentic, vulnerable conversations. Right. And so it becomes about kind of, um, finding their way through that. And it's sometimes it's clunky and awkward and really uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but that's the stuff that really builds true intimacy. And, and, right. and that's been, you know, in working with, um, sex addiction and partners, it's been my experience when they've really both done their work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they come in and they say that and they go, I thought we had some kind of intimacy yeah. and now I understand what, what, um, real intimacy yeah. is or real connection or a deep heartfelt understanding of each other and the feeling of being seen and heard by each other that they've never experienced before yeah. when they when they've actually done the work which is really really hopeful that even out of these very uh, traumatic situations yeah. that um, true intimacy can really take place mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if this is your experience but I actually, a lot of the couples that go through this actually stay together more than, you know, on, you would think. Yeah. Um, and uh, which is really, exci really exciting yeah. and, and is very hopeful for a lot of people. And they really find a new kind of relationship yeah. that they never had before. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's a big reason why I do the work because mm -hmm. it's so... Um, you know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel for people when they can't see it themselves and um, really see and experience in the room with them how much better their relationship is than they thought it could be. Right. Um, that's, that's such a beautiful, um, like you said, it's a, kind of the reason we do the work, you know, yeah. all of this pain in the beginning. Yeah. But then you can really get to see them have that intimacy in a way that they've always been longing for yes. and not know how to get yeah. not quite know how to get it and that's where that family of origin work mm -hmm. comes in and how we bring in our own history into our relationship yes. and and once we understand that then we can we can actually move closer and, and feel more connected and that's that's yeah that's so exciting yeah. so so what are the some of the things that to get to that they get they got to start doing? Well, I think one of the things that um, oftentimes the person who has, who's either, who is either the sex addict or has acted out and been unfaithful, um, that person is often scared to come to the table and say, I made a mistake. Um, whether it is um, an acting out mistake, whether it's a mistake at work, any sort of mistake, though, I find that they are very hesitant to sort mm -hmm. of come to the table and they want to hide that but it's it's antithetical to the growth of the relationship because if a partner then finds out something whether it's acting out related or not and the person who has done that behavior hasn't come to them it mm -hmm. it it wipes away any trust that has been established so i think for the person who has um you know either been the sex addict or or been unfaithful to their partner, it's really important to say, hey, I have something to say here that I'm really uncomfortable about, or there's something about you that I'm not happy with. Um, so they have to really, when they get to this stage, they have to really keep that trust going by continually to be vulnerable, to share their feelings, even if it, there's discomfort around it. So they got to continue to work on it, that it, um, it can't, it's not like, okay, trust is established, we right, stop. Right, right. It's like... It's a, it's a continuous uh, process of nurturing that trust yes. and nurturing that relationship. Yeah, and I think what I often see, it's like, the, you know, when things like that happen, um, the partner who has been betrayed starts to have so much more trust in, in their husband or wife because they see, oh, this person can come to me um, when they're really struggling with something and it has them being able to trust that person in a, in a much stronger way than they were able to before. Right, so um, that trust, a lot of people ask me, like, will I ever be able to trust him or her again? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is yes, but yeah. it takes a continuous effort on both parties to, 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 I guess, nurture that, continue to nurture that trust and grow it. And yeah, I think it's, it's the little things, right? It's the, you know, um, 
when you say you're going to go to the grocery store and pick something up, you go to the grocery store and pick something up. It's those seemingly little things in everyday life that the more a person who has lied or acted out can follow through with those things, the more it's going to, um, it's going to rebuild the trust. And I think for the partner who has been betrayed, there, you know, those triggers we were talking about, there is a tendency to sort of go right back to how you felt in the beginning when there is a trigger. And so I think for the partner, it becomes about, you know, this is where that support system comes in and, and, um, and getting kind of a reality check when things happen so that um, the partner doesn't initially accuse or lash out at, at the other person. Right. So they got to really establish those, um, those boundaries around that and operate in that uh, idea of uh, taking a deep breath and really being uh, open with each other and tolerant of each other's feelings and to kind of grow that relationship. Yeah, back. exactly. Wow. Yeah, and I think a lot of times what I see um, with couples is like once they've sort of moved out of those initial stages and they're trying to rebuild intimacy, that there's a lot of, I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say or do here in this situation. And what I tell people is that that's enough of a conversation starter. You know, you can go to your partner and say, I want to be able to talk to you right now, but I just, I, I don't know how to say it. I mean, that's authentic. That's honest. That's at right. least, you know, a, a form right. of intimacy. Right. Yeah. But in the, it, you know, it's like there's hope mm -hmm. and the relationship do get better. And um, so um, if, if someone was watching this video mm -hmm. and a partner was watching this video right now, what would be the one thing you would want to tell them? Um, you know, to let them know if they're watching this and they're and they're going through this. Yeah. What would you What would you want to tell them? Well, I, maybe two things. <laughs> two things. Okay. Two um, things. The first thing would be that uh, you're not alone. There mm -hmm. are so many um, men and women going through situations like this as we speak. Um, not everybody is reaching out for help, but uh, but that's the first thing is that mm -hmm. you know that that you're not alone. And the second part is that there is really. Um, effective help that one can get and so I would say reach out get support whether that's going to a 12-step meeting whether that's getting group support individual therapy going to a treatment center reach out and get therapeutic support because there are so many resources that can be had once a person reaches out for support but if you stay in isolation none of those will be able to be accessed all right and what would you tell the um maybe the person who's struggling with sex addiction or has done the betrayal, what would you want to tell them? If they're watching this and uh, this is, they're on that side of the fence, what would you want to tell them? What I would say is that it will be impossible to get any sort of clarity about what you want in your current relationship or marriage if you are still acting out or if you are still in contact with the affair partner. Um, and the other part of it is, is that, you know, it's not a, it's not a finger pointing game. It's not, you know, it's all your fault and you're, you are only to blame. It's really important to understand how this happened in context. Um, and I think it's also important for that person to realize that there is help on their side as well. There is a way to get it under control. There is a way to understand it. Um, and that the relationship is salvageable if that's what the person wants. And if it's not what the person wants, um, getting the behavior under control so it's not repeated in the future is really important. Okay, okay. And if people wanted to, if they're struggling with this and they wanted to reach you, where can they find you? So I can be found on my website. It's cindyshadell.com. Um, I have a professional page on Facebook as well, and all my contact information is there. So they can reach you there. Yeah. And then we'll also put a uh, link on the webpage. Um, for more information and uh, to make it easy for you to contact Cindy if this is something that uh, you're struggling with and, and want help with. Um, uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.